So what we have here is really a confluence of three very interesting issues, which in a manner is unprecedented. We have a series of issues which emanate from the constitution. We have issues in terms of the legislature uh, and a certain enactments related to the GST. We have clearly unprecedented economic issues in terms of you know, how the government is going to source uh, the amounts which are need to be compensation. Uh, and this mix of issues, uh, as I said, is unprecedented uh, in terms of the challenges that it brings. To give a little bit of a historical perspective of you know, what really culminated into the GST, uh, we had a series of different taxes which were effectively legislated and levied by either the central and as most of you are aware under the scheme of article 246 uh, you had the for taxation uh, vested in the center which was list one the union list the states had their own uh, and in exercise of those a series of taxes were imposed by each of them so under list one, uh, there was the imposition of central excise duty, central sales tax and service tax. So we taxed the act of manufacture, we taxed the sale of goods manufactured, and we taxed the rendition of services. The states separately uh, taxed in the nature of entry tax or octroi, which were taxes based on movement and transportation. And if a sale transaction would occur, within the geographical limit of a state, then the state could effectively impose a VAT or a sales tax. Now, GST was actually 20 years in the making because to create a constitutional mechanism whereby instead of having all of these so many taxes, uh, we were able to have a unitary tax or a singular tax, which was the GST, A, it needed a series of constitutional changes, but more importantly, uh, the economics of taxation in terms of when we moved from what was the then existing system to a new system, there was likely to be for a period of time a lesser collection of tax during the process of implementation. And the issue always was, how were we going to effectively find means and methods to compensate the states for what would have been their likely loss of revenue? So going into the GST, you know, if we just look at what sort of revenue collections we had at the level of the states, and the states were effectively collecting the taxes I spoke of. There was also a state excise duty on alcohol and products of alcohol uh, and also products of petroleum. So as we went into the GST, a total of about 3.91, some people say 97 crores uh, or lakh crores of revenue is what was generated by the states. And uh, as you can see on the slide, you know, Maharashtra, Karnataka, Uttar Pradesh, Tamil Nadu and Gujarat were the top five revenue generating states. Uh, but one of the things which was going to happen uh, in the context of GST is that we didn't only have to look at these very high generating uh, states, but we also had to see the states which were the smaller states because A, they had lesser economic activity, therefore the potential to collect tax was lower, but in the smaller states, again, they received lesser investment uh, and from that perspective, therefore, their sensitivities in terms of revenue dependence were far greater. So this was the mix that we had to look at, that we were going to take away the taxing power of the center. We were going to take away the taxing power of the state. We were now going to fuse those powers into an ability to jointly levy one tax, and that tax was supposed to be GST. So to enable this, and you know, post almost 20 years of exploration and quite heated dialogue, including parliamentary debate and breakaways, etc. Uh, under the stewardship of Mr. Jaitley, we finally got to the mechanism. And the mechanism was that we introduced a new Article 246A. And under this particular article, we now created the constitutional mandate 
for the levy of a GST uh, and the powers now, both in terms of the legislative stream and the administrative stream to levy and collect the tax now vested in a the parliament at the center and the legislature of every state. So we created the constitutional mechanism, which in a way was the foundation uh, for the ability for us to bring further and more specific legislations at the level of the center and the state uh, to be able to make the GST a reality. Besides the factor that we needed the constitutional change, we also needed a body uh, which would represent the interest of center, would represent the interest of state, and the one concept of cooperative federalism, which uh, had been tested you know, in, in different situations, but for which we had seldom had a abiding mechanism. Now that cooperative federalism had to be formalized uh, in a manner that was practical and would function on a day-to-day -day basis. And the answer to that was to create the Goods and Service Tax Council. And that council was then created uh, as a creature of Article 279A. Therefore, its positioning uh, and its formation is actually embedded in the Constitution. Its members are the center, the states, and the union territories. The council functions under the chairmanship of the union finance minister. Uh, you then have nominees from the states who are typically the finance minister of each state or, or union territory. And it is really within their domain to take all of the decisions, uh, which are the decisions in relation to ensuring that we have a workable GST. And therefore, uh, the host of issues that within the constitution uh, come within their domain, uh, go from the oversight of administration to the ability to tweak the tax structure, to the ability to work out the appellate mechanisms, uh, to also uh, work out the mechanism if the center and states were really to be in a dispute. And it was often mm -hmm. that, you know, that part of their empowerment uh, would never really get tested while they could create a mechanism uh, to deal with disputes between center and state or state and state. It was always felt that that mechanism would really be an almost untested mechanism because to its credit, DST um, Council just became an outstanding uh, advertisement for cooperative federalism uh, because of the fact that every decision which was taken and still is taken, is taken by a matter of unanimity. Uh, not because that's the voting pattern, but because that's the culture which has gotten created there, that irrespective of political affiliation, people really have voted uh, for what they thought was appropriate for India, its citizens and its businesses. Now let's go to the voting mechanism because for the first time, this now becomes in some manner important. The voting mechanism was that each state cast a vote. The total weightage of all state votes was to be two thirds of the voting community. The center exercised a vote, but the weightage of that vote was that it was equivalent to one third of the total votes cast and all items were to be carried by a minimum three-fourth majority. Uh, this mechanism ensured, one, that the states could not be sidelined, and in fact, the states were assured that they had a more than equal participation in the voting. Uh, the center, through the factor that it had one-third of the votes, but the required majority was three-fourths, essentially had a veto. So, while the center on its own could not carry an agenda item, the center on its own could block an agenda item. But the entire scheme of voting was really constructed in a manner to keep reinforcing the cooperation between the center and the states. And as I said, it has had some outstanding results up until the last few months uh, where we came up to the compensation crisis. Now, simultaneously with the structure in terms of 
the Article 246A empowerment, the putting in place under Article 279A of the GST Council, there was, of course, the central issue of compensation. And in the 101st Constitutional Amendment Act, Section 18 very clearly provided that the Parliament shall, by law and on the recommendation of the Council, provide for compensation to the states for loss of revenue which is arising on account of the implementation of the goods and services tax for a period of five years. These words, implementation of the goods and services tax is something that I think we should just keep in mind because we will see its relevance uh, as, as we speak further on the issue. So the situation was your amendment act in its very formation had a section 18 and the section 18 obligated a mechanism to be put in place to secure the compensation for the state, states. Uh, the periodicity was contemplated as five years uh, and the position which was given to it was a exalted position because you were really putting it in as part of the act which act uh, really brought about the 101st uh, constitutional amendment. Now, the one issue which came up is having worked out the fact that there was to be a clear compensation mechanism. The other issue was how would we measure the compensation? And again, after a lot of debate, uh, it was decided and it was what many people believe fundamental to the entire bargain for people agreeing, the states agreeing to come into the GST fold, that they were assured that upon a base rate of taxation, which would be the year 1516, they would be secured a 14% increase uh, in the amount of the tax that they could expect to collect. And this was to be on a compounded basis. And the compensation mechanism worked on the basis that when you compare the number of what should have been received vis-a-vis -vis what was collected as tax, the difference was to be compensated. So to illustrate it very simply, if the base tax collection of a state uh, in the year 1516 happened to be 100 crores, then uh, under the GST, in the first year of the GST, they were expected to collect 114 crores. And the year after that, again, on a compounded basis, it would go up by 14%. So let us say for the first year, you took the number of 114, but the actual connections happened to be 102. Now in that situation, 12 would become the compensation, which was required to be given to the state. And the compensation mechanism was built on two realities. One, the reality, which was both constitutional and commercial, that states had to be funded uh, to look after the citizens resident in the state and states had to effectively expend money on lots of their social responsibilities to the citizens. So one situation was the imperative of this money uh, was very deep because it actually is going to affect the lives of citizens. The second situation was you mapped the 14% increase based on a predictive economic uh, trajectory to say that if we saw how taxes had moved and increased over a period of time, the situation was that you also had to provide a escalating assurance. And if the escalating assurance wasn't met, you had to give compensation. Now, there was a little bit of generosity in the 14% because the actual calculation of what the projected rate of increase was, was going to be closer to nine or 10%. But, you know, there were extensive debates at that point in time, and some of us had the opportunity to listen in or participate, even though we weren't a part of government. Uh, and the situation was that it was felt by Mr. Jaitley, uh, given his stewardship, that there had to be a little bit of an incentive. And one of the situations which beset our previous indirect tax system was that there was a lot of evasion. But the moment we brought in a GST, uh, which was going to be an electronic digital taxation system, the expectation was that more people would come into the tax net 
and as a result we would collect more and therefore there was no harm in creating a little bit of an incentive uh, in the compensation structure by giving 14 percent to really enthuse the states to get over their many reservations and actually become part of GST. So this mechanism was sort of worked out and then uh, from a legislative perspective to address the issue of the compensation we brought in a goods and services compensation to states act and this act essentially had all of the foundational provisions uh, to deal with how the tax uh, or the compensation says uh, would be levied collected and distributed so if we see the statement of objects and reasons of this particular act very clearly it is a singular objective to pay compensation to the states for the loss of revenue which arises from the implementation of GST. The first situation was how do we calculate the uh, compensation to be paid and that is effectively embodied in section 7. You essentially have a calculation of the projected revenue on the base year 1516 with the 14 percent compounded escalation and that you then compare as I just explained with the amount of tax which is actually collected and the difference of that is the compensation which would have had to be paid right the imposition of the cess itself uh, came under section 8 and uh, it was therefore really the charging section for cess uh, it was a cess to be levied on a list of pre-agreed goods or supplies uh, and it is one of those few charging sections which very clearly also articulates the purpose for which uh, the tax is to be collected. Generally, as you know, taxes are collected uh, and having been collected, their application is guided by various constitutional and uh, governance principles. Uh, but this is one of those uh, where the purpose for which you could spend was absolutely explicit uh, in the context of the charging section itself. And the one important point to sort of notice here is that while the purpose is very clearly providing the compensation, one of the other issues which is now contentious is what could be the periodicity of this cess. And there was a contemplation, if we see the very end of the provision, that this could be for a period of five years or for such period as may be prescribed on the recommendation of the council. So the legislative provision already had some play to be able to extend the five years, uh, although originally five years was seen as an adequate period of time for the states to be compensated and for them to then get into a situation of a steady state of tax collection so that after five years they would no need no compensatory support. Section 10 has two very important subsections. What it says is that the proceeds of the cess and such other amounts as may be recommended and these words again now become important uh, because there is a contemplation that besides the cess there could be some other amounts which can get credited to the fund and therefore in terms of the sources of fund very clearly the primary contemplation is that the cess as collected will go into the fund uh, but there is also some accommodation to say that some other amounts uh, which are recommended by the GST Council can also go into the fund. Now, under 10.2, there is a very clear mandate that all amounts which are payable to the state shall be paid out of the fund. Now, 10.2, therefore, seems to restrict the source for the payment of compensation to only such amounts as are in the compensation fund. Uh, and this has really now become one of the core issues uh, in terms of saying, you know, where will we pay from and where will we raise the funds? Uh, but one of the things which seems to be key is that to pay your compensation, if you're not recovering enough cess, uh, one argument which is being made is that you still have to bring in whatever money you want into the fund you should not reach a source outside the fund and whatever other source you bring into the fund 
which is contemplated in 10.1 to say cess or such other amount as may be recommended. That is the only pool which you can use to pay the states. The states on the other hand are saying, look, there is a sovereign commitment which is embedded in the constitution. The modality of how you do it and how money is brought in and what is the source of the money is less important than the promise which is made because that promise was really central to our decision to agree to come into the GST. So these are really, you know, the, the passages of legal interpretation and provision uh, that we will engage with uh, in the next few slides. Given these provisions, uh, if you go to the next slide, what we saw is that this cess was not a cess on your normal goods, but it was a cess essentially on goods which are termed in taxing parlance as sin goods <coughs> or goods where you could tax without there being any change in the consumption pattern <coughs> or goods that you would typically tax where the consumer would consume irrespective of the rate of tax. And, you know, the favorite candidates here are things like pan masala, tobacco, cigarettes, etc. Uh, please understand that alcohol is not part of GST. Alcohol is still taxable by the states, even under the constitutional scheme. So you would impose the cess on all of these products and the cess that you imposed on these products went into the fund and the fund was to be utilized to effectively pay the compensation. So that's the structure that we effectively had. For a period of time, uh, the compensation mechanism worked and, you know, you had a situation where although, uh, you know, the compensation collected uh, was robust in certain situations, in the first year you released a little lesser, you therefore had balances, uh, you know, and the trend of the first one or two years is that we were collecting enough of cess uh, and we therefore were able to address the compensation mechanism. Where it all started sort of coming under a lot of stress was coming into 1920 and you know much of 2019 was a area of low growth, low economic activity, low investment and since GST is a tax on transactions, the lesser the transactions you have, obviously the lesser the tax that you will collect. So from that perspective, we started hitting a trough in 2019 and you know that then exaggerated uh, over 2021 uh, and obviously uh, that in terms of its adverse impact, the adverse impact multiplied on account of the COVID. So we now had the issue that the compensation to be paid uh, was actually far lesser than the cess that we were generating. The recent history, uh, which is the fractious history, uh, is one which sort of tells us that Around the September of 19 is the first time that the states really started making a noise, saying that we are A, not receiving compensation, says uh, in the numbers we should, uh, B, we are not being compensated uh, by, by the center. Uh, and from our perspective, the situation is, that is really starving us of being able to fund the various state-related programs that we have uh, which are critical for the citizens. Uh, as this sort of conversation was evolving, uh, what we also had uh, was that, you know, pretty much the March of 20 uh, signaled the, the official recognition of the COVID impact. Uh, and from then, as we all know, we went into lockdown. Uh, and the issue was, that we reached a stage where the state said uh, by the end of May that the amount that you owe us is now 2.35 lakh crores uh, and growing. And from that perspective, you, the center, are responsible to ensure that we are paid. Uh, it is in that circumstance that the center uh, confers with the attorney general and seeks his opinion. And while one has not seen the opinion of the Attorney General, it is widely reported that it has two fundamental parts to it, which is to say that the states are fully entitled to receive the compensation. So there is no doubt in the fact 
that constitutionally and legislatively they are secured the right to receive compensation. On principle, therefore, there is no real dispute. The issue is who is supposed to fund this payment if there is a shortfall in terms of the cess which is collected. And the view, reported view of the Attorney General is that it is not the responsibility of the center. Uh, it is his view that the GST Council must find the means and mechanisms of raising the funds in whichever manner that they agree, which are the funds which can now be brought into the compensation fund uh, and the resources you now bring into the compensation fund are the ones which must be applied to pay compensation to the states. We got then uh, to the 41st GST Council meeting uh, and which I would think in a manner both in terms of the events which preceded it uh, and what occurred at that meeting uh, was a unique meeting uh, in the life of the GST Council because for the first time, you know, we really had a situation where the state and the center uh, were actually sitting on the opposite sides of the table. And uh, as you can imagine, the situation is that those states which are the non uh, uh, BJP states uh, and the states which are, uh, you know, under other dispensations uh, in terms of having other parties in power have been the ones who are quite vociferous. Uh, but it is a common request and a common pain point of all states that, you know, the compensation must come. Now, the approach taken by the center was that instead of looking at this as a cohesive compensation mechanism, the center said that we need to make a bifurcation. And the bifurcation is that if we see the amount out of 2.35 lakh crores, which is attributable according to the center to GST implementation shortfall, then according to them, that is 97 lakh crore. And according to them, 1.3 lakh crores are issues which emanate from COVID, which is an act of God. And those fall outside really the ambit of the GST implementation. And therefore that amount is really nothing to do with GST implementation. It is just a pure shortfall. And it's a pure shortfall which really falls outside of the compensation mechanism. So what you have for the first time is that what has still now been a council which in the spirit of cooperative federalism has been conducted in the most cohesive congenial spirit uh, for the first time has an issue in terms of saying that states very vociferously said we do not agree with this sort of bifurcation at all. This bifurcation of act of God being outside compensation and you know implementation being within compensation uh, while we are still in the period of the five years is not something that we are willing to, to consider. What the center said is that US states are entitled is undoubted. However, the only source of this compensation is the compensation fund. Into the compensation fund go the cess, nothing else goes into it. And therefore the only source by which you can be compensated is the cess and the quantum of cess which is collected. If the quantum of cess collected is not sufficient, then you GST council must come up with a mechanism to bring in more resources into the fund so that the compensation can be paid we as the center have no obligation to pay you directly, nor do we have a singular obligation to bring money into the compensation fund. Uh, however, to the extent that there has to be a, a, a shortfall which has to be addressed, uh, what we are willing to look at is that we as a center will support any move to extend the period of the cess, which was supposed to be five years to a greater number of years so that over a period of time, the cess which is there uh, continues to accrue 
and you can use that cess uh, in a manner to pay what? You can use the cess which you will effectively generate in the future to pay the borrowings which we now are suggesting you must make for the compensation to be paid. So in that mechanism, uh, the center came up with two options. Now, the fact that the center on its own came up with two options uh, was itself seen as in some form or manner, not quite uh, the right thing to do, given the very consensual nature of the forum itself. Uh, so from that particular perspective, uh, the situation was that uh, the two options which were placed were options which were considered uh, by the center. The center was at great pains to say, look, we are only putting it to you for your consideration. We haven't decided. And to put it very simply, the two options effectively were that the amount of 97 lakh crores, which uh, was the so-called uh, implementation phase amount and uh, segregated from the COVID phase amount, Option one is that the states go and effectively borrow this amount. Uh, the center will help them coordinate the borrowing and the amount is borrowed would then get put into the fund and from the fund will then be released to the states as their compensation. The center has offered to sort of get this amount at a very reasonable rate of interest. And the center has given its reasons for not borrowing itself to say that if they borrow, then the government securities uh, actually suffer. And as a result, the national borrowing goes up uh, in terms of interest rate. And the national borrowing uh, going up is a function of the rating of the government of India and therefore, not only does government debt become costlier, but it is also costlier for all industries to borrow. So they said, look, we shouldn't borrow because it is costly for India. You, the states, effectively, you all go and borrow. The other situation is, option two is borrow the whole amount of 2.35 lakh crores, borrow from the debt market. Uh, over a period of time, this will get paid. Uh, we are willing to uh, offer as center assurance for repayment, although we will not repay, but we will give assurance for repayment. And from the future cesses that we will collect, we will effectively pay this. Uh, however, the cost of funds till we are able to pay uh, should be borne by the states. You bear the interest rate. And finally, when we get the cess, we will use it to pay the principal borrowing and we will also use it to pay whatever interest you people have borne. Now, the states are, of course, uh, up in arms and their situation has been that there is no way that we can fund the borrowing. Uh, but more importantly, whether we are economically able to or not, from our perspective, legally, we were never ever required to fund this borrowing and, you know, ensuring that the compensation cess was adequate and if inadequate that we were paid the compensation we have to get is and always was the responsibility and assurance of the central government. Mandate of the law is of course extremely clear and I think the most basic aspect of the law is that it is the states who are to be compensated and therefore if we see this as a flow of fund situation very clearly the flow of funds is to the state uh, the question is, where does the flow of fund come from? The flow of funds comes from the compensation fund which is set up, uh, but today there is just not enough in that compensation fund. So in, in that uh, position, so the, the uh, situation therefore is uh, you have to pay the states uh, and the state's right is implicit but the squabble is, you know, how are we really going to go get this, this amount of compensation? So in the formulation of what the center is saying, 
uh, quite simply, it comes down to the fact that for the compensation that is to be paid to the states, the states must go and borrow the money to pay themselves. Uh, and while ultimately that will be paid out of the uh, compensation says to be recovered in the future, uh, the situation is the cost of interest today must effectively be borne by the states. So, you know, the, the issue we now come to is that several of the states have very vociferously said that as far as they are concerned, uh, this option which is offered is a complete no-go. And several states have therefore very clearly said that they will seek to initiate proceedings if they have to under Article 131. Now, as you all know, Article 131 is uh, the factor of the exclusive jurisdiction of the Supreme Court in relation to any center state dispute. Uh, now, if you see what has gone to the Supreme Court, typically under 131, is, you know, center's authority to inquire into uh, a chief minister's conduct, uh, you know, issues in terms of dissolution of assembly, border disputes, water distribution, power distribution. You know, these are the typical issues which have gone. It is potentially going to be for the first time that we are going to get a money claim between the center and the states. And at a size of 2.35 lakh crores, <coughs> this potentially is going to be one of the largest and most defining disputes, if it goes there, between uh, the center and the state in terms of our commercial and constitutional history, something like this hasn't happened. Uh, also, you know, this is actually unprecedented in most of what we would sort of call the developing world or in the developing economies. So I think we are now at the threshold of something historical happening, whichever direction this goes. Now, you know, as we go into this, I think there's some words of wisdom that uh, the Supreme Court uh, has, you know, effectively offered in, in situations of center state and the whole concept of uh, collaborative federalism to say, you know, how should powers be exercised? And the emphasis, of course, is continually on collaboration to resolve issues. And as you talk of collaboration, to resolve issues. Uh, the other issue which sort of comes up is, uh, does one or the other have primacy? And uh, what Supreme Court has cautioned repeatedly is that, you know, the center should not indulge in a show of power. Uh, the show of power is really the last resort uh, in the sort of cooperative system we have. And in the manner in which we have uh, our system, and especially in the context of the GST Council, really the consensual process must go forward. And if the consensual process fails, because for the first time we may have a pattern of voting in the GST Council, where the states are voting in one direction and the center is voting in the other, then you know where do you go? Because from that face off, sadly there is no answer other than Article 131 and the Supreme Court. So in this situation, you know, what are our possible solutions? One situation is that uh, increased taxation is certainly not a good idea economically uh, across all goods. But even if you did it across all goods, it has no impact in terms of the cess collection, because as we know, the cess is only on uh, a certain quantum of goods and a certain list of goods, uh, for example, as we said, tobacco, pan, masala, etc. Now, quite honestly, historically, it is proven that the elasticity of consumption of these products is such that whatever your tax, uh, people will consume. So one situation is, while we may not uh, impose the cess on motor vehicles or coal, that really there is no downside to imposing more taxes on tobacco products on gutka, pan masala, etc. You know, there is aerated waters in that list. So you have few products that you could do that for. There is in that particular list also a omnibus item in terms of taxes in the nature of assess on other supplies. 
So there is some thought that services, which are more conspicuous services. So for example, you know, services in costly restaurants, services in costly hotels, you know, business class travel and above by air, that all these should be subjected to the CES because today uh, we have a desperate need to be able to raise funds. Now, uh, given, however, the fact that economic activity is low, because even let's say we brought in a CES on, you know, business class travel and above, the number of people flying by air today is so low that you will hardly have a collection. So increased tax right now is not the immediate answer. Uh, the second situation is we need to go out and borrow. Now, if you need to go out and borrow, the situation is there is, of course, a cost of borrowing. Uh, and if there is a cost of borrowing, the question is who will bear that cost? Very clearly, the states are making out a case and probably rightly so to say that, you know, I can't borrow to pay myself. Commercially and constitutionally, that's a issue which is not even statable. Now, the other aspect besides the borrowing uh, and borrowing by the states is, can we have a situation where in a COVID related situation like the world is seeing, we can have the center either borrow the money or print the money. And we are seeing this situation all over the world that economically, every major nation is printing money effectively to fund the issues which arise from the COVID crisis. So uh, if you look at a lot of economic commentary, it will tell you that either the center should borrow or even better than that, the center should print money. And the one way to do it is print money today or as a center borrow today, increase the tenure of the CES by let us say another three years and borrow uh, what you borrow today against the security of the CESs you will collect in the future. And as soon as the CESs come in, which may be a little period of time, uh, you start paying. Uh, so we have alternatives from increased taxes, which will only impact over time to borrowing, which effectively is central borrowing to issuance of separate bonds you know so we could for example issue bonds which were the gst compensation bonds uh, we could print more money so that you know we don't have an interest cost and we can increase the periodicity in terms of the number of years for which we can collect the sets now you know as we sort of look at that solution what is this actually doing uh, to us as a nation uh, in both domestic and international perspective? If we see the next slide. So let's be clear that the problem is absolutely genuine. I, it would be ingenious to say that, you know, either the center or the state is uh, doing something uh, which does not, you know, quite meet the test of credibility or quite meet the test in terms of propriety. We have a problem. The question is, we are trying to look at a solution to the problem and the center has made a suggestion. I don't think it's a very popular suggestion, but the center has made a suggestion. Now, given that it's a genuine problem, the only way that we are going to address it is by the factor of a solution, which is probably a combination of the factors that we effectively spoke of in the previous slide. But in the meanwhile, what has happened? In the meanwhile, what has happened is that for the first time in the life of the GST Council, you have a position where center and state are certainly not in agreement and will probably definitely, when I say probably definitely, I'm accommodating a little bit of the political affiliations, but it is likely uh, that there will be all the states voting under the, under the umbrella of saying, we need compensation. We don't want to take your option as you are offering to us. What that is going to do is that this GST council, which has worked for a long time on the basis of consensus, obviously the chemistry of that is going to get distorted. Uh, the other situation that I think we are facing, uh, and this is comment which is even coming in from investors outside of India is, what is this saying about the approach of our government? Uh, is it correct to argue 
that while we talked of the implementation process as being the process of moving from old taxes to GST, and while we gave it a period of five years, could we in the middle of that now say that, you know, uh, if COVID occurred within this five year period, then it is proper and justifiable for us to make a distinction between COVID related impact and implementation related impact. A lot of people are saying that if the GST has to be credible, then you have to see the whole implementation period as one period and we can't bring in these artificial uh, outside forces like the COVID. The COVID is a one-time occurrence. We have to address it, but you know, we should not affect our credibility uh, for years to come by looking at a solution which is not a balanced and credible solution. The second issue which comes up is that when you have a federal structure, there is a certain moral commitment that the center makes to the states and vice versa. And the one question is, through what is now happening, have we distorted that moral commitment? And have we put a question mark on that moral commitment in terms of saying, look, if circumstances are bad, you know, commitments have to be renegotiated. Uh, while I can understand that in a contract between parties, can that be the approach when we are talking of the constitutional scheme, where we are talking of constitutional provisions and legislative provisions. So again, it raises a huge issue. And you know, as the center and state fight this out uh, or confer it, let me not say fight it out, but confer it, uh, what you're going to see is, what is the message which is going to the global community? The global community of investors, where we are saying, if you are leaving China, come to us. Uh, where we are talking of alliances with nations in terms of regional trading agreements, etc. What is the message which is going out? That if in a moment of crisis, the center and the state in India themselves are at loggerheads, because one of them is alleging that the other is not keeping its bargain, then, you know, am I going to put in billions of dollars of investment uh, in a system where, you know, if things change, there could be a question mark on whether commitments will be kept. So from, from that perspective, you know, we sit on a quite volatile set of issues, not only internationally, but also in terms of our internal structure, uh, our whole federal structure. And I think uh, one hopes very much uh, that, you know, somebody of the stature of the prime minister will intervene. Uh, and we will work out a mechanism, uh, you know, which is not so bureaucratic, which takes the larger picture of India and Indian citizens, because ultimately the money, wherever it goes, is supposed to be deployed for the citizens of India. And the citizens of the state are no different from the citizens of the center. Uh, you know, that's, they are one and the same set of people. So from that perspective, I do hope that we don't get into litigation, that we don't wash more dirty linen in public, that, you know, the sagacity that we saw with Mr. Jaitley returns uh, and, you know, somebody like PM steps in to address this issue. But it's an unfortunate development. Uh, if we allow it to escalate, it will become something which will always be spoken of adversely in India, uh, you know, whenever we look back on this event. If we address it, I think it will be a triumph. Uh, you know, for the spirit of cooperative federalism. And uh, my own sense is uh, that, you know, uh, we should be able to bring that sort of approach to resolving this. But if we don't, uh, we will have the mother of all litigations in India. The first question is, can more goods and services be added to the list of notified goods for GST compensation says to increase the corpus of the fund? If yes, is it recommended? What could be the pitfalls of doing so? So there is, of course, a ability to um, widen the net in terms of those items on which you want to levy the cess. The temptation to do, do that needs to be balanced by the fact that we did not want to create multifarious taxes and tax rates when we went into GST. 
uh, and you know ideally the world over you have sort of two tax rates for GST uh, a standard rate and uh, you know what uh, is a higher rate now if we brought in more items under the cess what would happen is that we would now have a tax structure which has a central GST a state GST and a cess on top of it and the burden therefore uh, on a product in terms of the taxation goes higher but because it's an indirect tax that burden of course gets passed on to a consumer and therefore the more products that you bring under cess uh, your your disadvantage is the same as what you have when you have very high taxes on products which is that we will now instigate an inflationary trend uh, in terms of a consumption pattern and that is something that we really need to avoid so yes it is possible under the mechanism to bring in more items uh, but if you did it on a widespread basis uh, you are likely to trigger an inflationary trend how can the loss of gst during pandemic be recovered by the states and how compensation says corpus is going to affect in this scenario yeah and I, I think you know that's a very good question uh, i think much of the presentation was focused on that that uh, your mechanism today uh, for compensation sadly is singularly just the cess now if you are to move to trying to bring in more resources uh, one is expansion of the ambit of the items which you tax uh, or your situation is you take a short term measure because everything is really being spoken of only for this fiscal year and in that short term measure you know you, you find another resource whether it's a fiscal instrument like a bond or it's a borrowing or you know it's a pure printing of money which rbi lends to the state and center under article 293 increases uh, the quantum of borrowing and the borrowing limit so uh, the issue while sort of quite simple that yes you have to compensate and yes you have to find the resources the the generation of that resource is sort of really been the challenge there's also the responsibility for that generation and uh, you know i think given the factor that this is now had the amount of adverse media that it has had and the fact that many uh, chief ministers are now directly writing to the prime minister you know i think we will we will see a central measure uh, which will now come to address this as a issue rather than more taxes or borrowing by states uh, the third question is is act of god a valid defense to statutory obligations the answer very clearly is no and here the issue is exaggerated by the fact that it's not just leg legislative it's also constitutional you know the 101st amendment act under section 18 specifically contemplated this and then you brought legislation to effectuate that so uh, you know the stance that it's an act of God and because it's an act of God, you know, it's a answer to what is a legislative commitment uh, or what is worse, a constitutional commitment. Uh, personally, uh, I think is not a very good argument and maybe it does not also behove a, a government uh, of a nation like India to make that argument.